Good morning. And welcome to the second program of Hans Christian Andersen's Storytelling in Central Park online from New York City throughout the world. We are thrilled to be able to invite fantastic storytellers from six continents to tell stories while we're still online. I'm happy to say that we'll be back in Central Park and hope many of you can join us in August and September. This is the 65th summer of Hans Christian Andersen's storytelling in New York City. This summer, what we've done is ask storytellers to either tell an Andersen story and then the other teller or tellers to accompany that or expand that story, reflect on that story with a story that Anderson may have been inspired by or a story that feels like it's exploring the same ideas that Anderson is exploring. And today we have two wonderful storytellers, Angela Halvorsen Bogo from Oslo and Hugh Lupton from England. My co-host is the wonderful Simon Brooks, who's going to give you a little bit of any tech information you might need. If you're joining us, please just, we'd love to have your comment, find out where you are, and then I'll introduce our first storyteller. Welcome, Simon. <laughs> Let me try that again. Hey, how's everyone doing today? I forgot to unmute myself. So this morning we've got some great people here today. Um, as Laura said, um, we are on the internet. We're hoping that no one is going to lose connection. But if they do, don't worry about it. Um, we will muddle through this as best we can, bring another storyteller up if necessary. Um, but anyway, we hope you enjoy the show. Angela Halvorsen Bogo is an exceptional storyteller. She has a quality of warmth in her telling that makes it possible to feel as if she's right with us during this internet storytelling. She's also the director of something called the Festival of the Fool. And next weekend, she is presenting an amazing um, day-long festival called Midsummer Storytelling, which we'll advertise uh, for you in the chat room and hope that you can join us for that as well. When Anderson was first writing his stories in the 1830s, he attempted to write a ghost story. And that story became one of his most interesting and mysterious and beautiful um, iconic literary fairy tales called A Traveling Companion. And Angela is going to tell us this story. It, it just takes an incredible intelligence and love to uh, retell a story like this, sort of taking it off the page, a story written in 1835 and still has a lot of meaning for us today. So I want to um, welcome Angela. Thank you. I will begin by telling you that John was all alone in the world. His whole family were gone and recently his father had died. And John decided now what would he do with his life? He decided to leave everything that he knew behind and set off into the world. And all he had with him was two gifts from his father, his inheritance, a bag of silver coins in his pocket, and a strange dream where his father had appeared to him on the night that he died in the dream, which was full of light. John saw his father standing next to a young woman. His father said, look at the bride you have won. 
she was a princess. She was wearing a crown. And when he woke the next morning, he had no idea what that meant. But now here's John setting off into the world. His father had always told him to trust life and live as a good man. Now, at the end of the first day, at dusk, a huge storm filled the sky. It began to rain and hail and there was a great wind and John looked for somewhere to get out of the storm and there he saw ahead of him a small hill and on the top of the hill a church. He ran up, he pushed the door open and as he'd been walking all day long, he sank down onto the floor and slept. And he was woken in the middle of the night. The storm had passed and now the moon was shining in through the windows. And John saw that in the middle of the church, there was a coffin. Somebody who would be buried the next day. Now, John wasn't afraid of the dead, not at all. But his father had told him to be careful more of the living. And in fact, there were two scoundrels standing there beside the coffin, trying to open it. And John jumped up and said, what are you doing? You mustn't do this. He owed us money, said one of them. Now we'll never get the money back. We're going to take his body and throw him outside the church. That's what we'll do. No, no, you mustn't, said John. Look, and then he reached into his pocket, took out the whole of his inheritance and said, this is all the money I have, but you can have it if you would just leave that poor man to rest in peace. Well, the two scoundrels, they looked at one another and said, well, if you're willing to give the money, we'll leave him alone. And they took all John's money and left laughing. At sunrise, John set off again, now completely penniless. And when he came out the other side of a forest, a, seemingly from nowhere, a voice called out to him, John, where are you going? It was a tall, man with a traveling bag on his back and a walking stick. John said, well, I, I'm on my way out into the world uh, to see what will happen, to see what I can find. I'm doing the same, said the man. Maybe we could travel together. So the two of them walked side by side and John soon found that this man seemed to have seen everything in the world and knew how to speak about it. Now, when the sun was high in the sky, they stopped to rest under a great oak tree. John, of course, had nothing, no food. But his companion opened up that traveling bag and produced food for the both of them. While they were resting under the tree, along the path came an old lady she had a huge bundle of firewoods that she had collected on her back. And just as she passed in front of them, she slipped and fell badly and broke her leg. Now the traveling companion, he stood up and took from his traveling bag a small jar of ointment and smoothed some of it on the old woman's leg. And before John's very eyes, the woman stood up. She could walk, she could run, she could even dance, and she was overjoyed. It was incredible. She said to them, I have nothing to give you in exchange, but let me bless you. And she sang. All you require is here. Whatever you need, life will bring you. 
All you wonder will be made clear. Trust in the song's life's journey will sing you. And she went on her way and they continued. And towards evening, they saw ahead of them mountains. And the traveling companion said to John, Oh, the air up there, John, is marvelous and fresh. There's nothing like it. But we should rest before we go up there. And round the corner, of the, round the very next bend, there appeared an inn, the perfect place to rest. And outside the inn, a puppet show was just about to start. John and the travelling companion stood at the back and at the very front there was a large man with a big dog. The play began. It was about a princess wearing a golden crown. And just as this princess puppet swept across the stage, for some reason, who knows why, that dog at the front leapt onto the stage, grabbed the puppet, shook it in his mouth and broke the head off. The puppet show ended. The people left. The puppeteer stood looking down at his broken puppet. But the travelling companion took again that little jar of ointment and smeared some of it on the puppet. And she was as good as new, just like that. Only better, for now she didn't even need strings. The puppeteer said to the travelling companion, Sir, sir, I will give you all my money. Could you please do this for all the puppets? For he loved his puppets. He wanted them all to be free like this. No, said the travelling companion, not for money. But then he noticed that the puppeteer was wearing a large sword on his hip. He said, for your sword, I'll do it. So there was an exchange made. The travelling companion smeared all the puppets with the ointment and all of them could now move freely without strings. And... He was given the sword. So John and the traveling companion set off up into the mountains. Now, when they finally came to the highest point in the mountains, John was almost in tears with awe to imagine that he should be in such a place, such beauty. When he turned to look at his travelling companion, he saw the man looking down at the ground. There was the body of a white swan laid on the grass. The travelling companion was staring at it and then took the sword from the puppeteer and touched each of the wings of the swan and John watched as those wings lifted themselves up and folded themselves into the travelling companion's bag. He didn't understand what he was seeing, but they walked on. Not long after this, they saw the place where they were headed. It was a magnificent town full of silver shining towers and a palace beside the sea. When they arrived down in that place, they stopped at an inn and heard the story, the strange story of that place from the innkeeper. Oh, the king is a good enough man, of course, we all love him, but the princess, I'm sorry to say, she, she's very, very beautiful on the outside, but she's very, very empty and cold on the inside. And 
people say she's bewitched. She uses her beauty. How, said John, she lures all the young men to her. They all have a chance to marry her if they can guess three times what she's thinking. But nobody has managed yet. What happens if they don't do it, said John? Well, said the innkeeper, it's, it's very bad. The king is desperate. Nobody knows what to do. She sounds terrible, said John to the traveling companion. Just at that very moment, there was a great sound from the streets, cheering and, and people shouting and running. So they went outside to see. And sure enough, it was the princess who was riding through the streets at that very moment on a beautiful white horse. And she was so dazzling, so mesmerizing, that all the people forgot that she was wicked. And when John saw her, he was speechless because that was the woman he had seen in the dream the night that his father died. And he also fell utterly in love with her in one moment. Back inside the inn, he said to the travelling companion, well, if anybody can try to marry her, I must do it. No, said the innkeeper, you mustn't. No, said the travelling companion, you must not do that. No, said all the people who were in earshot. But John knew that he had to go and try. So he presented himself immediately at the palace. And the king at first was delighted to see this young man until he heard why he'd come. And then he also said, no, you mustn't do it. You must leave now, please. You mustn't do it. John smiled and said, I'm absolutely sure that it will be fine. So it was agreed that he would return the next day and that there would be judges and counsellors and the princess would come in and she would ask him what she was thinking. John went back home to the inn and told the travelling companion with great enthusiasm and excitement all that was going to happen. His companion, however, was not so enthusiastic. John was completely blind with love. The companion said, well, I am worried about you, but let's not spoil this evening. Let's, let's drink to the health of the princess. And from his bag, he produced a party drink, sweet, sparkling. And John drank two glasses of this drink and then fell asleep. And the travelling companion lifted him carefully into the bed. And when it was completely dark and quiet, the companion took from the bag the two swan's wings and attached them to his own shoulders and then flew out of the window across the town to the palace where he hid underneath the window of the princess's bedroom. Now, on the stroke of midnight, the windows flew open and out came the princess wearing a long white cloak and great black wings. And she soared out over the town and the traveling companion followed behind her. And she flew away from the town and over to a mountain and the companion followed behind her. But she didn't see him because he made himself invisible. And she stopped in front of this mountain and banged on the mountain until it started to rumble and shake. And then it opened up 
and she stepped inside and the traveling companion followed her and she went down a passageway that was lit entirely by tiny sparkling spiders, thousands and thousands of them. Down they went, the traveling companion behind, still invisible, until they came into a hallway, an open space that was full of strange creatures and an odd atmosphere. And there, in the middle of that space, was a glass throne, and sitting on it, a monstrous, ugly, wicked magician. And she came over and bowed down in front of him and said, I have another suitor. A young man has come. What should I say? What should I think of? The magician said, no, think of something ordinary. Ordinary. You won't guess that. Think of uh, your shoe. So she turned and she left. The traveling companion had heard everything and followed behind her. She flew all the way back to the town and to the palace and he followed her and flew back to the inn where he took off the swan's wings, climbed into bed. In the morning, when John woke up, the traveling companion said, John, I've had an interesting dream about the princess. I believe that when she says, what am I thinking? You should say, your shoe. Now, John completely trusted that whatever he needed would be provided for him. And when he heard that, he decided to just take that with him. And when he arrived at the palace, there were all the counsellors, all the judges, the king in all his finery. And in came the princess. And she stood in the middle of the room and said, so what am I thinking? And straight away, John replied, your shoe. Her face went white. You're correct, she said, and left. The room erupted with joy. Nobody had ever answered correctly, ever before. The king said, you must come back twice more, you know. You do realise you have to do it again. I do. I, it will be fine, said John. He ran all the way back to the inn. He told the travelling companion what happened. The travelling companion said, very good. Let's celebrate. Out came the drink again. John drank. He slept. When everything was quiet and dark, he put on the two swan's wings flew off to the palace and at midnight, just like the first time, out flew the princess and out came behind her the travelling companion, invisible. Back to the mountain, the same way, down that passageway with all the spiders, into the hallway. Again, she bowed down in front of the ugly, hideous magician and she said, he guessed correctly. He will come again tomorrow. What should I say? What should I think? <laughs> yes, he answered once. He won't answer twice. Think of, uh, think of your glove. That'll do it. Back she goes to the palace. Back went the traveling companion to the inn. In the morning when John woke up, the traveling companion was sitting saying, I've had another dream. This time, I think you should say your glove. Great, said John. Off he went back to the palace. Now, because he'd answered correctly the first time, there were a lot more people who'd crammed into the space. And now everybody was waiting to see, could he do it? Could he do it again? In she came. She said, what am I thinking? John said, your glove? Her face was ashen. She almost fell down on the ground. She was so shocked. Correct, she said, and left. 
the place went crazy. He had done it twice. Could he possibly do it another time? He went back to the inn. He told the travelling companion what happened. The travelling companion said, yes, very good. Once more, once more. I'm going to bed early tonight, said John. And he slept early. And late at night, the travelling companion left again with the swan's wings, flew over, followed the princess the third time, came to the mountain, down in the passageway to the hall. There, she said, he has answered twice. If he answers correctly tomorrow, I will have to marry him and I will not be able to come here again. Oh, he's nobody, said the magician. I'll think of something very good. Now, that night, it had been particularly windy and rainy and there was a storm building up outside and the magician liked storms so he said I will accompany you tonight let's fly together so the two of them flying along beside each other in the storm with the traveling companion behind still invisible they came all the way up to the balcony but still the magician had not said what it was that she should think of Right up to the balcony, the travelling companion was close behind and just before she flew inside, the magician said, tell him you're thinking of my head. And she went inside and just as he was turning around, the travelling companion got a hold of him by his ugly beard and he had the sword from the puppeteer with him and he chopped off that head and he threw the body down into the sea for the fishes to eat. And with the head, he went back to the inn and he wrapped it in a cloth and tied it. And in the morning when John woke, he said, John, when you go to the palace this time and she asks, what am I thinking? You must open up this cloth, but do not look at it before then. Do you promise? I promise. I trust you, said John. So he went off to the palace carrying the head. Everybody from the town was crammed around the palace. You could hardly breathe in there. In she came and she stood and said, what? am I thinking? And John opened up the cloth and out tumbled the hideous head of the magician. And she gasped and said, you're, you're right. And we will be married tonight. And she left. The place turned into such a celebration, such cheering, such joy, such happiness. It was over. John went back to the inn. He was overjoyed that he would be marrying the princess. But the traveling companion knew that the princess did not love him and was in fact still bewitched. So he said, John, tonight, when she is just climbing into the bed beside you, you must have a tub of water ready and then throw into the water these three swan's feathers from the wings and the tub of ointment. Push her into the water. She'll try and struggle. She'll come up once, push her down again. She'll come up again, push her down the third time. Only then will you have her free. John took the feathers, he took the ointment, and that night after the wedding service, in the bedroom, he had the tub of water made ready. And just as she was climbing in, he pushed her into the water with the feathers, with the ointment, and she screamed and up came a black swan. He pushed her down again and up came a white swan with a black ring around its neck. And he pushed her down again and up came the princess but she was free, all the shadow of the spell was gone. And she looked at him and she loved him and she thanked him for setting her free. The next day, 
there were hundreds of well wishes and the king came and presents and so on. At the very end was the traveling companion with his walking stick and his traveling bag. And John said, you're not leaving now, surely stay with us here, stay and enjoy our happiness. No, I have fulfilled my debt now. Your debt, said John? Yes, you know, at the very beginning of your journey, do you remember the church and the coffin and how you gave everything that you owned to make sure that man could rest in peace? I do, said John. I am that man. And now I have paid my debt to you. Blessings, be happy. And then he seemed to just disappear. And John and the princess lived happily all their lives, had many children. And later on, John inherited the kingdom and became king. And everyone there lived in peace. Thank you. <laughs> How you managed to make that story so clear as crystal, incredible. How remarkable. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah, you. that was that was excellent. That was so good. Thanks, Angela. Such a mysterious and beautiful story that I feel like my eyes have been on a journey from one remarkable image to another, and something very mysterious and so beautiful about the companion. I'd agree with that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, after um, the next story, we'll all come back together and, and talk about this. So, thank you. Lovely. Thank you. It's um, a remarkable story, both kind of um, magical and spiritual, uh, mysterious, and kind. And so it's um, kind of beautiful now for me to bring onto our virtual stage one of the most influential and generous and really brilliant storytellers in Europe, Hugh Lupton. Hugh has done such incredible work with, um, from this smallest little tale to a retelling of the Odyssey and other great stories in a way that no one else tells a story. And um, I think it would be quite interesting to listen to the story that you're going to tell, which is a story from the Bible, actually. And so I'm so curious to hear how this story unfolds and especially because it's told by my friend and really inspiration for storytelling for so many years, you loved him. Well, to begin at the beginning, once upon a time in the city of Nineveh, there lived an old, a good old man called Tobit, a merchant. And his wits were as sharp as they had always been, despite his great years. And it was the feast of the Passover. He was sitting at the table with his wife, old Anna, and the son of their old age. His name was Tobias. And the table was groaning with the unleavened bread and meats and fruits and olives and wine. And the old man stood up and he blessed the meal. But before he sat down, he took his plate and he turned it upside down and said, I will touch neither food nor drink till I've gone out into the street. 
And the first person I meet whose belly is yawning and aching and groaning with hunger, I would invite him to come and sit with us at the table. And the old man took his walking stick and he hobbled out of the house and across the yard and into the street. And it was night time. It was dark. He could hardly see his own hand clutching the handle of the stick. He took three or four paces and he tripped over something that was lying in the road. And he crouched down and struck a light. And there was the body of a beggar, a corpse dressed in filthy, stinking rags outside his own house. And the old man lifted the corpse up onto his shoulder. And he hobbled through the streets of Nineveh and out of the city gates and he made his way to the graveyard and he found a spade and he dug a grave and he rolled the corpse into the grave, covered it with earth and he spoke the prayers to the dead. And then he hobbled back to his house, but because he was unclean, he didn't go inside. He slept in the yard, wrapped in his cloak. Now, in the yard, there was a tree. On the tree there was a branch and on the branch there was a sparrow's nest and all night the droppings fell from the sparrow's nest and splashed into the old man's face and into his eyes and the next morning when Tobit woke up he rubbed his eyes and there was a white film over them he could see nothing and he called for water and he washed his eyes but still he couldn't see and so he called for doctors with pills and potions, but the old man had lost the sight of his eyes. And he dropped to his knees and he said, Almighty God, I'm being punished for some sin that I have not committed. I'm being punished for some sin of my grandfather's, some sin of my great grandfather's. Please bring my suffering to an end so that my soul can ascend to heaven and my body return to the dust of the earth. Well, at the same time, in the kingdom of Medea, there was a town called Ekbara. And in that town, there lived an old man and his daughter. And they were good people. They never saw a foot sore traveler passing through the town without inviting him to come and sit with them at the table. And the daughter, her name was Sarah. And she was very, very beautiful. In fact, she was so beautiful that a demon had fallen in love with her. A demon called Asmodeus was besotted by her and unknown to Sarah, he'd taken up residence underneath her bed. Well, she had many suitors and many admirers. And there was one young man that her father approved of and she agreed to marry him and there was a wedding. And when the vows had been made and the prayers had been spoken and the seals were set, the bride and groom went upstairs to the bedchamber. But before the groom could bring the bride to the bed, the demon Asmodeus, obsessed and filled with jealous rage, leapt from under the bed, invisible. And with its long bony fingers, it strangled the bridegroom. Well, this happened seven times. Seven husbands on the wedding night and in her father's house, the servants began talking behind their hands, calling her husband strangler and murderess. And Sarah dropped to her knees. She said, Almighty God, I've been punished for some sin that I have not committed. I'm being punished for some sin of my grandmothers, of my great grandmothers. Please bring my suffering to an end so that my soul can ascend to heaven and my body return to the dust of the earth. Well, it so happened that the two prayers, the prayer of old Tobit and the prayer of beautiful Sarah were both spoken in the same moment and they rose up into the sky through the clouds and higher and higher and they came to the kingdom of heaven and there was God sitting on his throne and the prayers entered his ears at the same moment. And God turned and there were his angels, his cherubim, his seraphim, and to his right hand, the archangels. Gabriel, Michael, Uriel and Raphael. And God bowed his head and Raphael 
vanished. Well, in the city of Nineveh, old Tobit called his son, old, old Tobit called his son Tobias and his wife Anna to him. And he said, I have prayed for my life to be brought to an end. But if I were to die, then you would be left destitute. Listen, many, many, many years ago, I left 10 sacks of silver with an old friend of mine, a merchant in the town of Rajas in the kingdom of Medea. Tobias, my son, I want you to go and I want you to fetch those 10 sacks of silver and bring them here so that when I die, my heart will be at peace knowing that you are provided for. Well, Tobias was a young man, untried, untested, with his first beard on his chin. And he said, Father, I would gladly go, but I do not know the way. Listen to me and do what I tell you. Go to the marketplace. Ask here and ask there. And when you find someone who knows the way to the town of Rajas in the kingdom of Medea and who has time on his hands, take him as a companion and tell him that I will pay him one drachma for every day of the journey. And when he brings you home safe and sound, I will double his fee. And so Tobias did what he was told. He went to the marketplace and he asked here and he asked there. And it just so happened on the steps by the fountain, there was a stranger, a man he'd never seen before. His name was Azarius. And he said, yes, I know the way. And I've got time on my hands. And well, he was happy with the fee and he seemed to, to be trustworthy enough. And so Tobias took him as a companion. And the next day they set off from the city of Nineveh through the city gates, Azarius striding ahead and Tobias following behind. And all day they walked. The sun was shining hot, hot, hot in the sky. And Tobias's feet by the end of the day were sore. They were blistered. And they came to the banks of the river Tigris. And Tobias took off his sandals and he sat on the riverbank and he dipped his feet into the cool water and he washed them. And as he was washing his feet, he felt a sudden sharp pain. He looked down and a fish, a strange, beautiful fish, the like of which he'd never seen before, had caught hold of one of his toes with its teeth. And Azariah said, quick, pull your foot out of the water. And Tobias lifted his foot and the fish was thrown onto the land, tossing and turning this way and that way, gasping and drowning on the air. And Azarius, the companion, said, now, take a knife, kill the fish, slit it open, cut out its heart, its liver and its gall and keep them safe. So Tobias killed the fish and slit it open and he took the heart, the liver and the gall. He wrapped them in a piece of cloth and he put them into the wallet on his belt. And Azarius lit a fire cooked the fish and they ate the meat and it was sweet and then they slept on the banks of the river and the next day they continued their journey and all that second day they walked and they walked and towards the end of the afternoon Tobias saw that they were approaching a small town and Azaria said ah this town it's called Ekbara and there's a household here that always welcome strangers. And they began to make their way through the streets of the town. And Azarius turned to Tobias and said, I'll tell you something, my friend. The daughter of the house is very, very beautiful. She'd make you a fine wife, my friend. Well, they turned a bend in the road and there standing in the doorway was a young woman. And the moment Tobias saw her, he fell in love with her. And when she saw the strangers pale with the dust of the road, she ran out and she invited them inside and she looked at Tobias and for a moment she looked at him as a woman will look at a man. And then she turned and she led them into the house and they followed. And as they went through the door, Azarius put his hand on Tobias's shoulder and he said, but there's something you should know, my friend. She's been married seven times already. Every husband has died on the wedding night. Tobias said, then I I must have nothing more to do with her. If anything were to happen to me, it would make, break my mother's heart. It would break my old father's heart. And Azariah said, listen, what harm would there be 
in my asking her old father if he would consider you as a son-in-law. And if he agrees, then why not get married? And when the vows have been made, you'll go upstairs with her to the bedchamber. Think of that, my friend. And you'll see in the corner of the room, there's a stove. Take the fish's heart and the fish's liver. Throw them onto the charcoals and all will be well and all manner of things will be well. Well, Sarah led them to the pump and they washed themselves from head to foot, washed away the dust of the road. And then they were led to the table and they sat down and meat and drink were served and they ate. And when they'd finished eating, Azarius leaned across the table to the old father and he said, would you consider my companion here as a son-in-law? And the old man said, well, who is he? What's his name? Where's he from? Who's his father? My name is Tobias. I come from the city of Nineveh. My father is old Tobit, the merchant. Tobit? Tobit, who was married to old Anna? Yes. Oh, I know him well. He's a good old man. Tell me, how is he? He's lost the sight of his eyes. Oh, old age. It shows us no mercy. But yes, my young friend, I would consider you as a son-in-law. And Sarah reached across the table and she took Tobias's hand. But the old man continued, but you know, she has been married seven times already. Every husband has died on the wedding night and you will be the eighth. Azaria said, friends, let us not dwell on what has been and what is yet to come. For the past is over and gone and the future is veiled in mist. And so there and then there was a wedding. Tobias was married to Sarah. And when the vows had been made and the prayers had been spoken and the seals were set, the bride and the groom went upstairs to the bedchamber. And no sooner was he in the room than Tobias looked about himself. And there in the corner, there was a stove with charcoals burning. And he took the fish's heart and the fish's liver and he threw them onto the coals. And straight away, the room filled with a thick white smoke. And from under the bed, there came the sound of coughing and choking and the demon Asmodeus clutching his throat, cursing and spitting, stamped a hoof on the ground. There was a flash of light and the demon was gone to a cave in distant Egypt where he crouched hiding for a thousand years, trembling. And Sarah took Tobias by the hand and led him to the bed. And they lay down together and they made great joy, as it says in the old stories, and they fell asleep with their arms around each other's necks. Well, the next morning, the old father fetched a spade and he went out into the garden and he dug a grave. And then he called his servants. He said, go upstairs and fetch the corpse, the body of the son of Tobit, and we will bury it here. And the two servants climbed the stairs, dreading what they were going to see. And they lifted the latch and they opened the door. And there were the bride and groom, asleep in one another's arms. And the servants ran down the stairs and told the old man and he dropped to his knees. What I feared has not come to pass. Blessed is God and blessed is the kingdom of heaven. And when at last Tobias and Sarah came downstairs, the old man came across and he said, son of Tobit, my new son, my daughter's husband, we will have a wedding feast now. There will be food, there will be drink, there'll be music, there will be dancing, there will be singing. The feast will last for 14 days and nights. And I swear by mighty God, you will not cross the threshold until the feast is finished. But Tobias went to Azarius. He said, what am I going to do? My father and mother will be counting the days until my return. Their hearts will be wrung with worry for me. And Azarius said, listen, this is your wedding. This is your wedding feast, your wedding nights. Stay here, my friend. I will go and fetch the silver. 
And Azarias turned on his heel and he walked out of the house and he journeyed across the kingdom of Medea until he came to the town of Rajas and he acquired five donkeys and he found the house of the old merchant. He secured the ten sacks of silver. He slung the sacks of silver over the backs of the donkeys, one to either side of each donkey. And then he led the donkeys back across the desert to the town of Ekbara, where the wedding feast was still in full swing. But in Nineveh, old Tobit and Anna were counting the days until Tobias's return. The old man had reckoned on four days journey there and four days back. And so on the eighth day, Anna went to the city gates of Nineveh and she looked along the road, watching and waiting. And there was no sign of Tobias. And on the ninth day, she returned. And still no sign of him. And the tenth, the eleventh, the twelfth day passed. The thirteenth day, and still he didn't come. And she went to her old husband and she said, Old man, what are ten sacks of silver beside the life of our son, who surely has perished on the road? Well, in the town of Ekbara, at last, the 14 days of feasting were finished. And Sarah embraced her old father. And the next morning, she set off with her husband, Tobias. And with the five donkeys and the ten sacks of silver. And Azarias striding ahead. It was now 17 days since Tobias had set off from the city of Nineveh. And all day they walked. And that night they slept on the banks of the river Tigris. And the next day they continued their journey. And in the middle of the day, Tobias could see on the horizon, the city walls of Nineveh looming into the sky. And Azarias turned to him and he said, listen, your father and mother do not know that you are a married man. Tobias, you should go ahead and prepare them to meet your wife. And so Tobias went on ahead and the others followed behind. But old Anna was standing in the shadows of the city gates of Nineveh, looking along the road, her heart heavy with sorrow. And all day she watched. And then towards the end of the afternoon, she saw far away, there was a figure walking towards her. And she rubbed her eyes and she looked again. And yes, there was no mistaking him. It was her son. And she turned on her heel and she ran through the streets of Nineveh and she called to her husband, Tobit, old man, Tobias has returned at last. And then she turned and she ran back and through the city gates and along the road and she threw her arms around Tobias's neck. And old blind Tobit, with his stick, felt his way out of the house and through the streets until he came to the gates of the city. And Tobias embraced his mother. And then he saw his old father standing in the city gates. And he ran forwards and he seized the old man's hands and he said, Father, I'm home. And at that moment, Tobias felt a hand on his shoulder. And he turned and there was Azarius. And Azarius said, my friend, take the fish's gall, rub it into your father's eyes. So he opened up the wallet. He took the fish's gall and he rubbed it first into one of Tobit's eyes and then into the other eye. And the old man lifted his fingers and he rubbed his eyes and rubbed his eyes. And when he opened his eyes, the white cloud was gone and he could see. He said, Tobias, my son. I see you as clearly as I saw you on the day that you were born. But where have you been? Why have you been so long? And Tobias said, Father, Mother, I'm married now. And look, here comes my wife. And he lifted his arm and he pointed. And there, striding along the road towards them, they saw beautiful Sarah. And she was leading the five donkeys and over the donkeys backs, the 10 sacks of silver. 
the old man dropped to his knees. Blessed is God, whose ways are vast and fathomless, and blessed is the kingdom of heaven. And then the old man scrambled to his feet, and he opened up his purse, and he started counting drachmas onto the palm of his hand, so he could pay Azarius. And Tobias said, Father, you shouldn't pay him with drachmas. You should pay him with silver. For he has defeated a demon, he has won me a wife, he has secured your silver, and he has opened your eyes. The old man nodded, and he pulled open one of the stacks, and he started counting silver onto the palm of his hand. And Azarius looked at the old man and raised his hand, and he said, I do not want your dragons. I do not want your silver. You have paid me already with the joy of your hearts and the prayers and the praises on your tongues. I hold them in my hands and I carry them to the kingdom of heaven. And suddenly wings burst from Azarius's back. Suddenly his whole body was shining with light. So that Tobias and Tobit and Sarah and Anna covered their faces with their hands. And when they lowered their hands and looked again, Azarius was gone. And in the kingdom of heaven, God was sitting on his throne. And he turned and there were his hierarchies of angels and cherubim and seraphim. And to his right hand, the archangels. There was Gabriel and Uriel and Mikhail. And then he saw that Raphael had returned. And he saw that Raphael's hands were filled. And that was the end of that story. If it be bitter, or if it be sweet, carry some away and bring some back. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like crying. It was such. That was a, a beautiful big, story here. Story. Um, <laughs> I think we've seen how love is the way that we can um, get rid of demons, mm. <laughs> draw wealth of heart. And how incredible to see these two stories side by side. Shirley Anderson must have heard this story told as a child. Um, let, let, let's um, bring Angela back. And what was it like for the two of you to hear each other's stories? Um, you? <laughs> well, I mean, it, Anderson must have been aware, surely, of the story of Tobit. I can't believe no. that he wasn't. Mm. Um, I mean, it begins with the with the burial, but in in the story in the book of Tobit, the burial is sort of incidental. It um, the burial of the beggar. It it triggers the the yeah. prayer, which leads to the companion's arrival, the arrival of the of Raphael as Azarius. But the sort of emotional journey of the story is so parallel in so many ways. Yeah. yeah. And just the, that detail also, and I wanted to ask Angela about the beginning of the traveling companion again, because the act of compassion of the death of the beggar and, it, and also Raphael, you know, I've never felt such, um, I don't know, Joy in yeah. the angels, <laughs> companions. Angela, what what really taught you at the beginning of your story, and how was it to hear 
Tobias and the angel. It was, it's like there, there are so many points where the stories are weaving the same idea, the same theme. Um, really, it was really moving. It was really a joy to hear that story straight after telling the traveling companion. Mm. But is it is it an apocryphal story? Yeah. yeah. Because that's yeah. even more because the likelihood that Han, that um, that Anderson had heard an apocryphal story is less likely than if it was, you know, from the Old Testament, Orthodox Old Testament. So I'm I'm completely fascinated yeah. by that. Yeah, I mean it's it is it's one of the apocryphal stories for, for the. I mean, I think in the Orthodox Church, and I think in the Catholic Church, it's considered an official book. Yeah. But the Anglican Church and the Lutherans and the Calvinists, it consi it's considered an apocryphal one. So I imagine that for Hans Anderson, it would have been an apocryphal book. Yeah. And then, of course, he may have heard it as in adult. Also. Yeah. And also, I mean, Aspionson and Moa in their collection have a the companion hmm. which they collected as an oral story hmm. and which is actually very similar to the story that angela told so hmm. maybe it was also it was kind of working its way in the oral tradition but there must be you know it's always fascinating the way the written and the oral kind of um interweave and reflect each other yeah, because didn't Howard um, Howard Pyle he he wrote a similar story as well, the Stork King, if I remember right. I think it was Howard Pyle. The Stork King, which was again one of those stories where somebody follows the woman and has, in, in the version that Pyle told, had to hold the woman and she changed. You know, which again has that reference of Tam Lin at the end, yeah. the transformation. Mm. I do want to say something about how it was so engrossing to hear the both of you. And I was so aware of the fact that there wasn't a moment where you were just mouthing words. It was like you each knew the story and were letting us really hear the story in such um, a riveting way that I think we could follow this story, but we could also feel in ourselves something shifting inside of us as we listened. It was utterly uh, masterful and generous. And I really, I loved hearing these stories. And it made me so aware of Anderson's, um, it was like his storytelling instinct. Mm. Yeah, I wonder what kind of reaction, you know, other than the the, the rah rahs and the kudos that that have been sent, what other kind of visceral reactions uh, some of the listeners had, or watchers had out there? That's you. Right, write in the comments what you thought about these two stories. Is there anything else that I wanted you want to just say? Um, what made you choose this of all the Anderson stories that there are, Angela? You know, I um, came across that story years and years and years ago and wanted to tell it. It was like, one day I'm going to tell it. And this is the first time I've told it. It's like sometimes stories, wow. they just, sometimes they just, you know, they sit in you for 20 years until for some reason it's the right time. And, uh, and I also, so when I said that I wanted to tell this story, I haven't looked at it for a long time. And when I went, I went to look at it, so, oh my goodness, this story is enormous. <laughs> how, how am I going to tell this story in the time? Uh, so it was a big challenge to keep on looking for the essence of it. Because there's so much more. The original version, of course, is very detailed and, uh, yeah. I thought you did a wonderful job. I yeah. thought you told it really well, and I thought the way that you condensed it, it really felt as if it was all there. I didn't feel I was missing anything. Wonderful. 
Thank you. Yeah, it was d distilled to perfection. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question actually about the puppets that came to life. Such a curious interlude that isn't mentioned again. No, and you know that the story I told a year ago in the festival <laughs> is called The Puppeteer, and it's the same idea. So he must have had an idea, a thing with puppets that come to life. Because they, they appear, they come to life, and that's it. They're gone. Well, I think Very he not only made, he had a little puppet theater as a child, but I think he watched puppet plays in Odense in Denmark as a child. His grandfather may have actually carved puppets. I can't. And his grandfather was a shoemaker. <laughs> well, we do have to stop because it's 1206. And um, those of you who had the chance to listen to this live, thank you for being here on Facebook and YouTube. And please tell people because it, this will be up for quite a while and people can come back and you can listen to this story again and again. And I just want to say it's so um, juicy and luscious to have, you know, Hugh Lupton, Hugh Lupton who we were very young when we met. <laughs> And just you can feel, and, and Angela, to this lifetime of knowing how to bring a story to life so that the words are not standing between the story and the listener, but actually the story moves through the body of the storyteller. And that is the um, kind of the almost invisible art of this event and you two just completely excelled in that i could i actually felt a little remorse when each time when your stories were over like oh there's not more <laughs> let's hear the next <laughs> and just anyway um beautiful stories incredibly told the wonderful um so thank you really from the bottom thank of you, yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, lovely, thank you for the invitation. Lovely, that lovely you, to put those two together and just see, see the chiming. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, so please pay, stay tuned for the next event. Every single pairing is magnificent. But this was extremely special. And I think we were all very lucky to be here. So much for demons. Have faith. <laughs> we will get rid of them. <laughs> Hopefully. So um thank you. Uh, I think that Simon is putting on all of this um information for everyone. And I will post on the Anderson Facebook page the Midsummer Festival that is coming up next week that is sort of conjured by dear Angela. So thank you all and um, have a really good week. And uh, pay attention to who comes to meet you on the road. <laughs> <laughs>